took place. Let me begin briefly with the thank yous. Number one, thank you to the board and our new president, Gary, for coming up with the idea of having some shear during the weeknights. It's been a challenge for us to do so over the years, but perhaps we hit upon the right plan. And uh, Bez Hashem, a mini-series seems to be something that people can handle and successful, could be successful, uh, even starting this late in the evening. I want to thank everyone for coming. That's tremendous to see such a turnout. I'm literally overwhelmed. I can't imagine how all of you are able to make it like this. This is incredible. And uh, I do want to say that, as my Rebbe once said, when we started a shir later in the evening, I'll be very careful not to trespass on the fourth dimension. I don't intend to go for too long. The shir will probably be about a half an hour, but as a shem each time. And that way it's something that people can deal with and still uh, go to sleep at a normal time. Um, it seems that the phone call idea was successful. I, I think that uh, it's helpful when people have that personal touch. And I appreciate that the board reached out that way. I want to thank the sponsor of the food. And say the shir this evening and the food is being done with Zeich and Nishmas, the Tova Fredel Bas Chaim Zev, and the sponsor is the Holzer family. Thank you so, so much. The Shari Tshuva tells us that one reason why Rus is read on Shavuos is because the point of Rus is David HaMelech, her great-grandson. David HaMelech was born on Shavuos. David HaMelech died on Shavuos. So therefore we read Rus on Shavuos. Here we are between Pesach and Shavuos during the three weeks or so that there can't be any weddings during the part of Svira where everyone holds that it's possible to be at a shir because there are no weddings, and we're preparing for Shavuos. But the Yalkut Shimoni gives another reason. The Yalkut Shimoni says that Kabbalah's HaTorah requires Mesiris Nefesh, requires special dedication, special force, and that this concept can be learned from Rus, who was Moser Nefesh to become a Gioras and to accept the Torah. Be'ez Hashem, during this shir we will see many aspects of Mesiris Nefesh within Megillus Rus. So let's begin by reading the first two psukim, and from there we'll have a whole introduction to what I believe Megillus Rus is all about. It was in the time of the judges, by Hira of Baaretz, there was a famine in the land. By Yelech Ish mi Beis Lechem Yehuda, a man went forth from Beis Lechem Yehuda, an area within the Yehuda tribe in Klal Yisrael, Logur Bistei Moab, to live in the fields of Moab. He left Eretz Yisrael to go to Moab. Who the Ishto Shnevanov? He and his wife and his two sons. The Shem Ish Elimelech. The name of this man was Elimelech. The Shem Ishto Naomi. His wife's name was Naomi. The Shem Shnevanov Machlon Vechilion. Their two sons were Machlon Vechilion. Ephrosim. They were Ephrosim. Needs to be explained. Rashi says, Chashuvim. To be explained further. The Beis Lechem Yehuda, they left from this area called Beis Lechem Yehuda, by Ovos named Moab. And they came to the fields of Moab, by Yehusham, and they stayed there. Rashi tells us a little bit about who this fellow Elimelech was. If you look in Rashi, Divrei HaMaschil Vayelech Ish, and the man went in Pasuk Aleph, the second Rashi. Asher God Olhoyo, he was a very wealthy man. Uparnes Hadar, and he was one of the leaders of the generation. Vayetzim Eretz Yisrael Lechutz Lawrence, and he left with his family from Eretz Yisrael to Chutz Lawrence. Why? Mipnei Tzorus HaAyin. Because of stinginess. Shehoiso eno tsara ba'aniyim habayim ludochko. Because his eye was narrow towards the poor people who came to push him, to press him for funds. Lekach nanash. And therefore, he was punished as the story goes on with he and his sons eventually dying. This is a fascinating thing to tell us about Elimelech. Elimelech was a very wealthy man. People were coming to him during this rav for food, for money, 
but he was stingy. And therefore, he just exited stage right. He just left the scene. But we know some things about this Elimelech. The Targum tells us that Elimelech was a Gavra Rabba, a great man. In fact, the Gemara Bava Basra and Tzadi Aleph tells us that not only was he a great man, he was the son of Nachshon ben Aminadov, the famous individual who was the first to jump into the Red Sea, thereby splitting the sea. Nachshon ben Aminadov was the Nasi of Shevet Yehuda, the most powerful tribe. He was a direct descendant of Yehuda. In fact, besides being an Asher Gadol, besides being the Parnes Hador, the Gemara says about Elimelech, Gadol Hador Hayu. Not only was the leader of the generation the Parnes Hador, the president, he was the Gadol Hador. He was the biggest Talmud Chacham of the generation. In Cain, we have to ask ourselves, how could a person of such stature desert his people? In their time of need, there's a famine. He has the funds. Why isn't he giving it to people? He should be out on the street asking people, come to me, I have money, I have food for you. Instead, he's selfish. Instead, he's miserly. He's greedy. Can you imagine? Rav Moshe Feinstein's every time with Rachel. Go to that door. He didn't have the funds to do this, that's true. Though when the IRS checked out his funds because he was giving more than half of his salary to Tzedakah, he was doing as much as he could, if not more. Could you imagine he just decided to pack out to Alaska because people were knocking on his door in need of funds? Could you imagine if Revel Yashiv, Zechar Levracha, would do such a thing? This was the Godel Hador, Gavra Rabba. And more than that, he's referred to as Vayelech Ish. A man went. We know that Rashi in Parsha Shlach, when talking about the Miraglim before they turned the other way, Shlach Bucha Anoshim, Hashem said to Moshe Rabbeinu, send men. And they're referred to as Kulam Anoshim, they were all men. We know they were all men, just read the names, there were no women amongst them. Kulam Anoshim, Kol Anoshim Shebemikra Loshim Hashivus. Anytime it refers to Anoshim and Ish, it's a man, it's a gavra, he's a chosh of a person. This individual, Eli Melech, was a chosh of a person. And furthermore, in Pasuk Beis, when it refers to him as the Shem Ha'ish, and the name of the man, it's similar to a Megillus Esther, Ushmo Mordechai. Chazal tell us, whenever you have that formula, Ushmo, and his name was, and then it says the name, that means the person was a tzaddik, that means the person was choshev. If you have it the other way around, you first say the name, and then you call him a shmo, you know he's a shmo. But when it says shame, and then it says the name Mordechai, or here, shame, and the name, he was a man with a good name. Anshe shame, people of a name, great men. Elimelech was a giant, a giant, expressed in numerous ways by the Navi right here in the beginning. How could he sin like this? How is it possible for Elimelech to be stingy and miserly and run away from his people? Now typically, Chazal minimize the sins of our heroes. The Gemara in Shabbos gives a few examples around after the Hamid Beis, where it says, for example, Misha Omar Ruvain Chata. Anyone who says that Ruvain sinned by Yishtav is Bilha, that he lived with Bilha, Ain El he's making a mistake. We all know the Chazal, Rashi bin Tzadon Chumash. He just was mevalbel the mitos. He just mixed up the beds. He didn't actually do the sin that the Pesach says. When you look about Shlomo HaMelech, Shabbos, Daphne, and Vavim in Beis, the Pesukim say that Shlomo HaMelech worshipped idols towards the end of his life. Didn't happen. Anyone who says that about Shlomo HaMelech, ain't no El He's making a mistake. But because Shlomo HaMelech let his foreign wives think they could get to him. Therefore, he's accused as if he worshipped idols. The Psukim often tell us an exaggerated version of what really happened. Chazal say about David with, with Elisheva. With what? Basheva. With Basheva. He didn't sin with her. The Gemara has to give a whole explanation of what happened. We learned at the beginning of the Sefer Shmuel Shir with the Bnei Eli. The Bnei Eli didn't do the sins that the Psukim described. Chazal always minimized the sins of these people. Why? 
because these people were great people. They were tremendous people. In fact, the altar of Slabodka in his Sefer Or Hatzofun writes about Korach in trying to understand certain Chazals describing Moshe Rabbeinu being very patient with Korach and who Korach was goes through a whole page where he explains something along the lines of Reb Moshe Feinstein in our generation we saw as the Godel Hador, a man who knew everything. But do you know what Reb Moshe Feinstein looked at the Chavetz Chaim? The Chavetz Chaim to him was a Malach. How did the Chavetz Chaim look at Rebbe Yekiva Eger? At the Vilna Gon from 100, 200 years before. How did they, the Vilna Gon and Rebbe Yekiva Eger, look at the Ramba, the Rashba, Rashi? It's almost incomprehensible the level of the Rishonim and how the Rishonim viewed the people of the Amoroim and the Gemara. You see how they took every word of the Amoroim so seriously. And the Amoroim about the Tanoim, can you imagine, says the altar of Slabotka, what the level of the people were in the time of the Dor Hamidbar? People who had actually seen and heard Kabbalah's HaTorah, the level was incredible. Says the altar of Slabot, the Korach was a tremendous tzaddik. But he rebelled against Moshe and deserved the punishment that he had. But you can't put him down as if he was just a lowlife. Far from it. It's funny, they say sometimes about the altar of Slabot and Hishmuzin, he makes every tzaddik look like a Russian, and every Russian look like a tzaddik. He's always trying to figure out the depth of the individuals. So Korach can look almost like a tzaddik, but he made a little flaw, and for that he made a mistake against Moshe Rabbeinu, there was a homach locus. But you see from here how great the people were in the time of Tanakh, almost unhuman. Of course, they were human. Humans sin. All humans sin. The Torah does not hide the sins of our great people, but it takes a magnifying glass to actually see what the sins were of these people. We put them on a pedestal and look at them as they're high and holy. And therefore, I reiterate the question, how in the world can we explain the sin of Elimelech, who at that point in time was the Godel Hador? How do we explain it? So I'd like to begin my explanation of Elimelech by stating a general approach that the Bali Musr have to understanding human nature. The Bali Musr found that there's a basic split between the conscious thinking mind and the subconscious emotional heart. Whereas it seems that our mind and our heart are only a foot away from each other, they're really Rahok Mizroch Mimayrev. They're miles and miles and miles apart. And one example of this is expressed very beautifully in the Sefer Chidush Halev by Rav Hanach Leibowitz, Sephardim of Racha where Noah was surrounded by water and the water was getting higher and higher. The animals were already in the table <coughs> and the water is up to the knees of Noah and Noah's not going into the table. The water is up to Noah's waist and Noah's not going with his family into the table. Vayovo Noah uvonov ishto nishevonov of ito el hateva mipnei mehamabu he only went into the Teva because of the waters of the Mabel. Says Rashi famously, Af Noach miktani Even Noach was from those who were small in belief in Hashem. Mamin ve'no mamin shiovah Mabel. He kind of believed, but kind of didn't believe that the Mabel would come. V'lo nifnas l'teva ajadokhu hamayim. He did not go into the table till the water was up to his neck and forced him in. A tremendous thing asks Rav Henech Leibowitz and many of the Bali Moser, how is it possible to understand that Noah was lacking in belief? After all, he just finished building a teva that took him over a hundred years to build. There were multiple miracles that happened in the building of that table for parts that were too heavy. And remember, before he had his three sons, he was building this himself, and he was already a 600-year-old man. And he's building this teva with divine assistance. And in the last days before the Mabel came, they say that the sun rose in the other direction and went around the world differently. It was beautiful days to try to give the people a last second to tshuva. He was going around with his grandfather, Mesut Shalach, telling people, I guess with a picket sign, the end is near. <laughs> it's time to do tshuva. How is it possible that a person who heard Hashem speak to him 
could not believe that the mob was coming. Hashem said it's coming. And after the animals came in twos or seven pairs and just marched into the table, he didn't even have to go out and get them. How is it possible for him not to believe that the mob was coming? The Balamosa answer of Hanukh Leibowitz writes it very beautifully. Logically, consciously, in his mind, he knew the Mabu was coming. But deep down, emotionally, in his heart, subconsciously, he couldn't believe the world would be wiped out. What would the world look like? Empty. There's no one here, even if there were 100,000 people that existed at that time. That's still a lot of people. How could it be that it's going to be empty? Anywhere I stand and I start talking, there'll be an echo. How can it be? It's just, it's just impossible. And therefore, the subconscious overrode the conscious mind, and he didn't go into the table until the very last second. He was pushed in by the water. There's a conscious and a subconscious. There's the emotion and the intellect. And the emotion often overrides the intellect. Rabbi Saul Salanter gave a marshal when he developed this theory of the conscious and the subconscious of an individual who was a carpenter. And the carpenter worked all day with wood, with various tools. And he had an apprentice who he trained, and he was good. The apprentice really was very good following in the footsteps of the master. A good person, a good woodworker. He was really the apple of the eye of the carpenter. The carpenter also had a son. The son was a good-for-nothing bum. He was lazy. He couldn't hit the hammer on the nail any time he tried. He couldn't get the hang of the woodwork at all. Ah, never. What a son. But then one fine night, at 2 o'clock in the morning, when there was a fire in the house, and there, on the second floor of the house, the master, the carpenter, is in the back bedroom, and there's a hallway coming out of the door from his bedroom, leading to steps that will leave the house. And he comes running out. You can imagine his nightgown with his nightcap on. He comes running out. The fire is everywhere. And in that house, there are two other bedrooms, one for his dear son and one for his apprentice. They were each asleep in their rooms. And he comes out into the hallway. Everything is a billable. The fire and the smoke is everywhere. And he has to make a quick second decision. If I turn into my son's room, I can grab him sleeping out of bed, jump out the window and save us, the apprentice will die. If I go into the apprentice's room, grab him out of bed, jump out the window and save him, my son will die. Who does he save? Said Rabbi Saul Salanter, of course he saves the son. That doesn't make a bit of sense. It's not logical. The apple of his eye, the one who's going to take over the business after him, the carpenter's apprentice, not the bum, the son. But the subconscious, the emotion, the heart, that link to the son is much stronger than the logical connection to the apprentice. The subconscious overrides the conscious. When a person's not thinking, he's going by his second nature, his instinct, he of course saves the son. So too Noah, in his mind, knew the Mabu was coming, but deep down he just couldn't believe it. Until finally he was pushed in by the water. So I'd like to take this idea that the Bali Musr Express and try to apply it over here to Elimelech, who seems to be stingy, who seems to be very narrow-minded and not caring. How could that be for such a great person, such a leader? There must have been some other motivation that Elimelech thought he was doing while confining what Rashi tells us to the background, to the subconscious. The al Kodesh says that the word Vayelech in Vayelech Ish is like Vayelech Ish mi Beis Levi. Amro went and remarried Yocheved. And what came from that new union? The Goel Yisrael, Moshe Rabbeinu, the Melech of Klal Yisrael. So too over here says the Alshef, Elimelech thought, I will go and get the Goel. I'm going to go on a trip to find the antecedent of Mashiach, of Malchus. 
And the Medrash says that's the meaning of his name. Eli Melech. Eli, to me, will come the Malchus. Malchus has to start with me. This was a point in time before Malchus existed in Klal Yisrael. Shaul came much later. David was the great-grandson of Rus, who will be introduced soon in the story. <coughs> Eli Melech, to me will come the Malchus. After all, he had the Yichus for it. He was a direct descendant of Peretz. If you don't believe me, you could look the last three psukim of Megillus Rus, though I didn't hand them out, where it lists the Yichus all the way down from Yehuda to Peretz all the way to David. Elimelech is in that list. He's the brother of Salmon, the son of Nachshon ben Aminadov. He had the Yichus. He was direct descent of Peretz. Melech porates Geder, says Chazal. A king breaks down walls. He has the right of imminent domain. He can throw somebody out of his land, break down his walls if he needs to for his own purposes. And furthermore, Elimelech was a descendant of Miriam. Miriam is called Ephros. And in Posset Beis, Elimelech is referred to and his children are referred to as Ephrosim. The Gemara says in Mesecha Sota, Dafir Alvim in Beis, towards the bottom of the page, that Ephros leads to David and leads to Malchus. We all know that Pua in Shifra and Pua fame, who saved all the babies. Pua was Miriam. <clears throat> and in reward for saving those babies that Paro said they had to kill, what was the reward that Miriam got? But a Malchus. Kingship was supposed to come from her. The Gemara says that Miriam was married to Kolev ben Yefuneh, also one of the great Nisim of Shevet Yehuda. I can only conjecture. I have no proof of what I'm about to say at all. But we somehow have to link the families of Miriam, from which Malchus must come, to the lineage of Beis David. How did that happen? Perhaps underlined, perhaps, Miriam and Kolev had a daughter. Perhaps that daughter was married to none other than Nachshon ben Aminodok, thereby connecting the families, which means that that daughter was the mother of Elimelech. So Elimelech now is Elimelech, the Yichus for the Malchus he had, both from the Miriam side and the Nachshon ben Aminodok straight through to Yehuda's side. And furthermore, who is Elimelech married to? Naomi was his niece. The Gemara says once again in Baba Basra and Tzadi Aleph, Naomi's father's father was Nachshon ben Aminadov. Ovi Naomi was the son of Nachshon ben Aminadov. So Elimelech married his niece. And now, between Elimelech and Naomi, they had these two children, Machlon and Kilion. Machlon and Kilion had the <coughs> ultimate yichus for Malchus. Every element of Malchus that existed in Klal Yisrael came to Elimelech and Naomi and fed to Machlon and Kilion. With all this in mind, why did Elimelech leave right now to go to Moab? Kingship. Conscious, subconscious. Big people. Tiny mistakes. Why did Elimelech leave now? Says the Gemara in Megillah and Daf Yudam in days that whenever you have the word Vayehi, it signifies a bad thing is about to happen. Vayehi v'me Achashverosh, have a homa. Vayehi v'me Shvod Hashovdim, have a rov. This was a very bad time period for Klal Yisrael. Why? Says the Malbim. This time period came right at the end of Sefer Shoftim, where it says in Perik Chof Aleph, Pasuk Chof Hei, by Yom Elohim, Ein Melech B'Yisrael, there was no king amongst Klal Yisrael, Ish Hayoshor Be'enov Yase. Everybody did whatever they wanted. And therefore, the Gemara in Bava Basra, on Dav Tesvav and tells us this was the time period of Vayihi Bimei Shvot HaShoftim. This was a time period where people 
judged the judges. The judges gave a psak. <clears throat> they told somebody, you did something wrong. And the people turned right back to the judge and said, we did something wrong, you did something worse. Rashi explains in Bava Basra Tezvavim and Beis, Shehoyu has shoftin atzman mikul kolim. The shoftin themselves were sinners. Vahoyu pishon per lenishpat. And this gave the, de the defendant the ability to say, Lahochiach es mochicho. You're giving me musr. You're telling me I sinned. You sinned. Shim omar lo has shoftin. If the shoftin says to the defendant, you lose, tol kisem ibein enecho. Take the splinter out from between your eyes. Histalik uparush me'avera katana shubiyodcha. Separate yourself from the small avera in your hand. Yochol zel omar, the defendant would say back to the judge, tol koro ibein enecho. Take that pole, that beam out from between your eyes. Parush me'avera chamura shubiyodcha. Separate from a greater sin that you do. The shoftim had no power. They were undermined. The people would say right back to them, you're a bigger sinner than me. Asks Tosvis, but it's not true. All of the shoftim were tzaddikim gemurim. I'd like to answer for Rashi that the people who were the shoftim were tzaddikim. But people claimed things about them in order to undermine them. By Hiv Meshvod HaShoftim, people judged the judges. They made up stories about them. I don't have to listen to you. Because there was no control through a melech, with a government, with a police. Ishko HaYosheb of Yasef. Everyone did whatever they wanted. They didn't listen to the judges who were the leaders of the people. There were no Shotrim to enforce the Shoftim. After a Din Torah, no one could enforce a Psaq. And we all know what the Mishnah says in Pirkei Avos about a country with a lack of government. Having mispal b'shloma shel malchus in the third parish of Pirkei Avos, you better daven for a good government. Shel malim orah, because the people were not afraid of the government. Ish esrei'ehu chayim blow. People would swallow each other alive. It's an absolute necessity to have a government that enforces the rules of the law as imposed by the leaders, the Shoftim. Therefore, Vayhiv Meshvot HaShoftim, that's the way the people were acting, they continued to sin. Vayhirov, there was a famine, a punishment. As the Rambam tells us in Hilchus Taniyos, any time something happens to Klal Yisrael, that's supposed to indicate to you it's time to do tshuva, it's time to cry out. And if you don't, then Hashem will just increase the bad things. Kalal Yisrael and Elimelech realized the Ra'av existed as a punishment because Vayihim Meshvod HaShoftim. So therefore, Elimelech leaves right now Dafka to do what? In order to find elements of Malchus to help end the Ra'av, to end the famine. If he's able to found the Malchus, Elimelech, to me, as the Malchus, I'm supposed to try to create this government somehow. Such a government will enforce the Shoftim. It'll bring law and order, as we said. And he thought this solution would force a quasi tshuva. Because the people could no longer sin by being Shvot HaShoftim. And therefore, the Ra'av would end. That, overtly, consciously, intellectually, perhaps, was the plan of Elimelech. I have dubbed that plan the mission. Elimelech left Eretz Yisrael at that point in time to fulfill this mission in order to found a Malchus through his tremendous yichus and therefore stop the Shvod HaShoftim that plagued the people at the time and stop the Rav, forcing them in a sense into tshuva. That's a pretty noble cause. It's fitting of a Godel Ador. In conclusion, let me just say, as Hashem, next time, we'll try to put all this together in order to show how it answers our question about Elimelech. 
And then we'll ask the next question. Why did he have to go to Moab, of all places, in order to accomplish this mission? Once again, thank you all for coming. Till then, have a good night. Go ahead. Thank you.